finely sculptured. And all the vaults, pillars, walls, jams, paneling, doors, statues, covered from top to bottom with a splendid green and gold illumination, which, a trifle tarnished at the epoch when we behold it, had almost entirely disappeared beneath wasps and spiders in the year of grace 1549, when Deville still admired it from tradition. Let the reader picture to himself now this immense oblong hall, illuminated by the pallid light of a January day, invaded by a motley and noisy throng which drifts along the walls and eddies round the seven pillars, and you will have a confused idea of the whole effect of the picture, whose curious details we shall make an effort to indicate with more precision. It is certain that if Ravaillac had not assassinated Henri the Fourth, there would have been no documents in the trial of Ravaillac deposited in the clerk's office at the Palais de Justice, no accomplices interested in causing those said documents to disappear. Hence, no incendiaries obliged, for lack of better means, to burn the clerk's office in order to burn the documents, and to burn the Palais de Justice in order to burn the clerk's office. Consequently, in short, no conflagration in 1618. The old palais will be standing still, with its ancient grand hall. I should be able to say to the reader, go and look at it, and we should thus both escape the necessity, I of making, and he of reading, a description of it, such as it is, which demonstrates a new truth, that great events have incalculable results. It is true that it may be quite possible in the first place that Ravaillac had no accomplices, and in the second, that if he had any, they were in no way connected with the fall of 1618. Two other very plausible explanations exist. First, the great flaming star, a foot broad, and a cubit high, which fell from heaven, as everyone knows, upon the law courts, after midnight on the 7th of March. Second, to your fears quatrain. Sure it was but a sorry dream, when a chorus grew justice, who having eaten too much spice, set the palace all aflame. Whatever may be thought of this triple explanation, political, physical, and poetical, of the burning of the law courts in 1618, the unfortunate fact of the fire is certain. Very little today remains, thanks to this catastrophe, thanks, above all, to the successive restorations which have completed what it spared. Very little remains of that first dwelling of the kings of France, of that elder palace of Aluga, already so old in the time of Philip the Handsome, that they sought there for the traces of the magnificent buildings erected by King Philip, described by Archaeologists. Nearly everything has disappeared. What has become of their chamber of the chancellery, where Saint Louis consummated his marriage? The garden where he administered justice, clad in a coat of Camelot, a surcoat of Lindsay Woolsey without seeds, and a surmantle of black sandal, as he lay upon the carpet of Jean Hue. Where is the chamber of the Emperor Sigismond, and that of Charles the Fourth, that of Jean the Landless? Where is the staircase from which Charles the Sixth promulgated his edict of pardon? The slab where Marcel cut the throats of Robert de Clermont and the Marshal of Champagne in the presence of the Dauphin. The wicket where the bulls of Pope Benedict were torn, and whence those who had brought them departed decked out in derision in copes and mitres, and making an apology to all Paris. And the grand hall, with its gilding, its azure, its statues, its pointed arches, its pillars, its immense vaults, all threaded with carvings. And the gilded chamber, and the stone lion, which stood at the door, with lower head and tail between his legs, like the lions on the throne of Solomon, in the humiliated attitude which befits force in the presence of justice. And the beautiful doors, and the stained glass, and the chased ironwork, which drove this cornet to despair, and the delicate woodwork of Ansi. What has time, what have men done with these marbles? 
What have they given us in return for all this Gallic history, for all this Gothic art? The heavy, flattened arches of Monsieur de Brosset, that awkward architect of the Saint Gervais Portal. So much for art. And, as for history, we have the gossipy reminiscences of the great Britain still ringing with their title of the country. It is not much. Let us return to the veritable grand hall of the veritable old house. The two extremities of this gigantic parallelogram were occupied. The one by the famous marble table, so long, so broad, and so thick, that, as the ancient man was, in a style that would have given gargantua an appetite, say, such a slice of marble as was never beheld in the world. The other, by the chapel, where Louis XI had himself sculptured on his knees before the Virgin, and whither he caused to be brought, without heeding the two gaps thus made in the row of royal statues, the statues of Charlemagne and of Saint Louis, two saints whom he supposed to be great in favor in heaven, as kings of France. This chapel, quite new, having been built only six years, was entirely in that charming taste of delicate architecture, of marvelous sculpture, of fine and deep chasing, which marks with us the end of the Gothic era, and which is perpetuated to about the middle of the 16th century in the fairy-like fancies of the Renaissance. The little open-work rose window, pierced above the portal, was, in particular, a masterpiece of likeness and grace. One would have pronounced it a star of lace. In the middle of the hall, opposite the great door, a platform of gold brocade was placed against the wall, a special entrance to which had been effected through a window in the corner of the grand chamber had been erected for the Flemish emissaries and the other great personages invited to the presentation of the mystery play. It was upon the marble table that the mystery was to be enacted as usual. It had been arranged by the purpose early in the morning. This great slab of marble, all scratched by the field of long clips, supported a cage of carpenter's work of considerable height. The upper surface of which, with the view of the whole hall, was to serve as the theater. And whose interior, masked by tapestries, was to take the place of dressing rooms for the constitution of the piece. A ladder, naively placed on the outside, was to serve as means of communication between the dressing room and the stage, and hand its painted rungs to entrances as well as to exits. There was no personage, however unexpected, no sudden change, no theatrical effect, which was not obliged to mount that ladder. Innocence and venerable infancy of art and contrivances. Four of the bailiff of the palace's sergeants, providing the all the pleasures of the people on days of festival as well as on days of execution, stood at the four corners of the marble table. The piece was only to begin with the twelfth stroke of the great palace clock sounding midday. It was very late, no doubt, for a theatrical representation, but they had been obliged to fix the hour to suit the convenience of the ambassadors. Now, this whole multitude had been waiting since morning. A goodly number of curious, good people had been shivering since daybreak before the grand staircase of the palace. Some even affirmed that they had passed the night across the threshold of the great door in order to make sure that they should be the first to pass in. The crowd grew more dense every moment, and, like water, which rises above its normal level, began to mount along the walls, to swell around the pillars, to spread out on the entablatures, on the cornices, on the window sills, on all the salient points of the architecture, on all the reliefs of the sculpture. Hence, discomfort, impatience, weariness, liberty in a day of cynicism and folly, the quarrels which break forth for all sorts of causes, a pointed elbow, an iron-shod shoe, the fatigue of long waiting, had already, long before the hour appointed for the arrival of the ambassadors, imparted a harsh and bitter accent to the clamor of these people who were shut in, fitted into each other, pressed, trampled upon, stifled. 
Nothing was to be heard but imprecations on the Flemish, the provost of the merchants, the Cardinal de Bourbon, the bailiff of the courts, Madame Marguerite of Austria, the sergeants with their rods, the cold, the heat, the bad weather, the bishop of Paris, the Pope of the Fools, the pillars, the statues, that closed door, that open window, all to the vast amusement of a band of scholars and writers scattered through the mass, who mingled with all this discontent of remarks, and the malicious suggestions, and quit the general bad temper with a pin, so to speak. Among the rest, there was a group of these merry imps, who, after smashing the glass in the window, had seated themselves heartily on the entablature, and from that point dispatched their gaze and their railings both within and without, upon the throng in the hall, and the throng upon the class. It was easy to see, from their parody gestures, their ringing laughter, the bantering appeals which they exchanged with their comrades, from one end of the hall to the other. But these young clerks did not share the weariness and fatigue of the rest of the spectators, and that they understood very well the art of extracting, for their own private diversion, from that which they had under their eyes, a spectacle which made them await the other with patience. Upon my soul, so it's you, Joan Frollo de Molendino, cried one of them to a sort of little right haired imp with a well-favored and malign countenance, clinging to the acanthus leaves of a capital. You are well-named John of the Mill, for your two arms and your two legs have the air of four wings fluttering on the breeze. How long have you been here? By the mercy of the devil, retorted John Frollo, these four hours and more, and I hope they will be reckoned to my credit in purgatory. I heard the eight singers of the King of Sicily intone the first verse of seven o'clock mass in the Saint Chapelle. Fine singers, replied the other, with voices even more pointed than their caps. Before founding a mass for Monsieur Saint Jean, the king should have inquired whether Monsieur Saint Jean likes Latin droned out in a Provencal accent. He did it for the sake of employing those accursed singers of the King of Sicily cried an old woman sharply from among the crowd beneath the window. I just put it to you, a thousand livres Parisi for a mass, and out of the tax on sea fish in the markets of Paris to boot. He's old crone, said a tall, grave person, stopping at his nose on the side towards the fishwife. A mass hard to be founded. Would you wish the king to fall ill again? Bravely spoken, Sir Gilles Nacomu, master of courier of king's robes, cried the little student, clinging to the capital. A shout of laughter from all the students greeted the unlucky name of the poor courier of the king's robes. Nacomu, Gilles Nacomu, said Sam. Cornutus et Hersutus, born them Harry, another went on. Hmm, of course continued the small group on the capital. What are they laughing at? An honorable man is Gilles Lacornu, brother of Master Jahan Lacornu, provost of the king's house, son of Master Mathieu Lacornu, first porter of the Bois de Vincennes, all bourgeois of Paris, all married from father to son. The gaiety redoubled. The big courier, without uttering a word in reply, tried to escape all the eyes riveted upon him from all sides, but he perspired and panted in vain. Like a wedge entering the wood, his efforts served only to bury still more deeply in the shoulders of his neighbors, his large, apoplectic face, purple with spite and rage. At length, one of these, as fat, short, and venerable as himself, came to his rescue. Abomination! Spatters of dressing the bourgeois left by Shinaide would have been flogged with a faggot, which would have afterwards been used to burn them. The whole thing burst into laughter. Hola, oh, hey, who is scolding so? Who is that screech owl of evil fortune? Hold, I know him, said one of them. Tis Master Andre Mounier. 
because he is one of the four sworn books on his other university. Everything goes by fours in that shot, cried a third. The four nations, the four faculties, the four feasts, the four procurators, the four lectors, the four booksellers. Well, began Jean Frollo once more, you must play the devil with them. Mounier, we'll burn your books. Mounier, we'll beat your lackeys. Mounier, we'll kiss your wife. That kind mademoiselle who died, who was as fresh and as gay though she were a widow. Devil take you, wild Master Andre Mounier. Master Andre, pursuing Jean Jean, still clinging to his capital. Hold your tongue, or I'll drop on your head. Master Andre raised his eyes, seemed to measure in an instant the height of the pillar. The weight of the stamp mentally multiplied that weight by the square of the velocity and the length of sight. Jan, a master of the field of battle, pursued triumphantly. That's what I'll do, even if I am the brother of an archdeacon. My gentry are our people of the university, not to have caused our privileges to be respected on such a day as this. However, there is a maypole and a bonfire in the town, a mystery, hope of the fools and Flemish ambassadors of the city, and at the university, nothing. Nevertheless, the Place Maubert was sufficiently large to hold one of the clerks established on the university. Down with the rector, the electors, and the procurators, cried Johannes. We must have a bonfire this evening in the Chandeyard, went on the other, made of Master Andre's books. And the desks of the scribes, added his neighbor, and the people's wives, and the spittoons of the deans, and the cupboards of the procurators, and the hutches of the electors, and the stools of the rector. Down with them! Put in little Jahan in his counterpoint. Down with Master Andre, the beadles and the scribes, the theologians, the doctors, and the decretists, the procurators, the electors, and the rector. The end of the world has come, muttered Master Andre, stopping up his ears. By the way, there is the rector. See, he is passing through the glass, cried one of those in the window. Each rivaled his neighbor in his haste to turn towards the glass. Is it really our venerable rector, Master Thibault, demanded Jehan from Old Milan, who, as he was clinging to one of the inner pillars, could not see what was going on outside? Yes, yes, replied all the others. It is really he, Master Thibault, the rector. It was, in fact, the rector and all the dignitaries of the university who were marching in procession in front of the embassy, and at that moment traversing the class. The students crowded into the window, saluting them as they passed with sarcasms and ironical applause. The rector, who was walking at the head of his company, had to support the place than I, putting it in his face. Saturnalitios Matimos Epidemius, Epidemius, with their white surfaces. Are those the theologians? I thought they were the white geese given by Saint Jean Vierre to the city for the thief of Rome. Down with the doctors, down with their cardinal disputations and quibblers. My cap to you, Chancellor of Saint Jean Vierre, you have done me a wrong. Tis true, he gave my place in the nation of Normandy to little Ascanio Falzapada who comes from the province of Bourges, since he's an Italian. That is an injustice, said all the scholars. Down with the Chancellor of saint jean vier Oe, Master Joachim de la Tours. Oe, Louis Daoui. Oe, Lambert Hotama. May the devil stifle the procurator of the German nation. And the chaplains of the Chachapel. With their grey amices from tunicus greases. See you do pelibus greases for artis. Olae, master of arts. All the beautiful black copes. All the fine red copes. They make a fine tale for the rector. 
Will you say that he was a Doge of Venice on the Venus bridal with the sea? Say, John, here are the cannons of Saint Javier. They are Dukes with a whole set of cannons. Are they Clochard? Dr. Clochard? Are you in search of Marie Lagafar? She is in the Duke of Latin. She is making the bed of the king of the debauchees. She is paying her four deniers. What do you want to get now? How do you know from whom? Would you like to have her pay you in the face? Comrades, Mr. Simon Saint-Blanc, the elector of Picardy, with his wife on the cropper. Post equitem seclet atra jura. Behind the horseman sits black care. Courage, Master Simon. Good day, Mr. Elector. Good night, Madame Electress. How happy we are to see all that, sighed Joanne de Melendino, still perked in the foliage of his capital. Meanwhile, the sworn bookseller of the university, Master Andre Mugnet, was inclining his ear to the courier of the king's robes, Master Gilles Lecoigneau. I tell you, sir, that the end of the world has come. No one has ever beheld such outbreaks among the speeds. It is the accursed inventions of this century that are ruining everything. Artilleries, bombards, and above all, printing. That other German pest. No more manuscripts, no more books. Printing will kill bookselling. It is the end of the world that is drawing nigh. I see that plainly from the progress of velvet stuffs, said the fur merchant. At this moment, midday sounded. Ah! exclaimed the entire crowd in one voice. The scholars held their peace. Then a great hurly-burly ensued, a vast movement of feet, hands, and heads, a general outbreak of coughs and handkerchiefs. Each one arranged himself, assuming his post, raised himself up, and gripped himself. Then to a great silence. All necks remained outstretched, all mouths remained open. All glances were directed towards the marble table. Nothing made its appearance there. The bailiff's four sergeants were still there, stiff, motionless, as painted statues. All eyes turned to the ascribe reserved for the Flemish envoys. The door remained closed, the popcorn opened. This crowd had been waiting since daybreak for three things. Noonday, the embassy from Flanders, the mystery play. Noonday alone had arrived on time. On this occasion, it was too much. They waited one, two, three, five minutes, a quarter of an hour. Nothing came. The dais remained empty, the theater dumb. In the meantime, wrath had succeeded to impatience. Irritated words circulated in a low tone. Still, it was true. The mystery, the mystery, they murmured in hollow voices. Heads began to ferment. A tempest, which was only rumbling in the distance as yet, was floating on the surface of this crowd. It was Jehan de Milan who struck the first spot from it. The mystery! And to the devil with the flames! He exclaimed at the full force of his lungs, twining like a serpent around his pillow. The crowd clapped their hands. The mystery! It repeated. And may all the devils take blunders! We must have the mystery instantly, resumed the student. Or else, my advice is that we should hang the bail upon the courts by way of a morality and a comedy. Well said, cried the people, and let us begin the hanging with the sergeants. A grand acclamation followed. The four poor fellows began to turn pale and to exchange glances. The crowd hurled itself towards them, and they all need to help. Who separated them from it, giving way and bending before the pressure of the throng. It was a critical moment. To the sun, to the sun, rose the cry on all sides. At that moment, the tapestry of the dressing room, which we had described above, was raised, and afforded passage to a personage, the mere sight of whom suddenly stopped the crowd and changed its wrath to the curiosity as by enchantment. Silence! Silence! The personage, 
little reassured and trembling in every limb, advanced to the edge of the marble table with a vast amount of flowers, which, in proportion as he drew nearer, more and more resembled genuflections. In the meanwhile, tranquility had gradually been restored. All that remained was that slight murmur which always rises above the silence of a crowd. Messieurs the bourgeois, said he, and mademoiselle the bourgeoises, we shall have the honor of declaiming and representing, before his eminence, Monsieur the Cardinal, a very beautiful morality which has for its title The Good Judgment of Madame the Virgin Mary. I am to play Jupiter. His eminence is, at this moment, escorting the very honorable embassy of the Duke of Austria, which is detained at present, listening to the harangue of Monsieur the Rector of the University at the Gate Bordet. As soon as his illustrious eminence, the Cardinal, arrives, we will begin. It is certain that nothing less than the intervention of Jupiter was required to save the poor, unfortunate sergeants of the bailiff of the courts. If they had the happiness of having invented this very voracious tale, and of being, in consequence, responsible for it before our lady criticism, it is not against us that the classic precept make things into seat the great book. Moreover, the costume of Signor Jupiter was very handsome, and contributed not a little towards calming the crowd by attracting all its attention. Jupiter was clad in a coat of mail, covered with black velvet, with gilt nails. And, had it not been for the rouge and the huge red beard, each of which covered one half of his face, had it not been for the roll of gilded cardboard, spangled and all glistening with strips of tinsel, which he held in his hand, and in which the eyes of the initiated easily recognized thunderbolts, had not his feet been flesh-colored and banded with ribbons in Greek fashion, he might have borne comparison, so far as the severity of his mien was concerned, with a Breton archer from the guard of Monsieur de Barry. End of chapter 1 First, Chapter 2 of The Hunchback of Notre Dame by Victor Hugo. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 Pierre Gringoire. Nevertheless, as the Horangian, to the satisfaction and admiration unanimously excited by his costume, were dissipated by his words. And when he reached that untoward conclusion, as soon as his illustrious eminence, the cardinal arrives, we will begin. His voice was drowned in a thunder of hooting. Begin instantly! The mystery! The mystery immediately! shrieked the people. And above all the voices, that of Joanne de Molendino was audible, piercing the uproar like the fight the rights of serenade. Commence instantly! yelled the scholar. Down with Jupiter and the Cardinal de Bourbon! vociferated Robert Christian and the other clerks perched in the window. The morality this very instant! repeated the crowd. This very instant! The sock and the rope for the comedians and the Cardinal! Poor Jupiter, haggard, frightened, pale beneath his rouge, dropped his thunderbolt took his cap in his hand. Then he bowed and trembled and stammered. His eminence, the ambassadors, Madame Marguerite of Flanders, he did not know what to say. In truth, he was afraid of being hung. Hung by the populace for waiting. Hung by the cardinal for not having waited. He saw between the two dilemmas only an abyss, that is to say, a gallows. Luckily, Someone came to rescue him from his embarrassment and assume the responsibility. An individual who was standing beyond the railing, in the clean space around the marble table, and whom no one had yet caught sight of, since his long, thin body was completely sheltered from every individual way by the diameter of the pillar against which he was leaning. This individual, he said, 
tall, bronze, polished, blonde, still young, although already wrinkled about their brow and cheeks, with brilliant eyes and a smiling mouth, clad in garments of black serge, worn and shining with age, approached the marble table and made a sign to the poor sufferer. But the other was so confused that he did not see him. The newcomer advanced another step. Jupiter, he said, my dear Jupiter. The other did not hear. At last, the tall blonde, driven out of patience, shrieked almost in his face. The shares are born. Who calls you? said Jupiter, as they were waiting for the start. I, replied the person clad in black. Ah, said Jupiter. Begin at once, went on the other. Satisfy the populace. I undertake to appease the bailiff, who will appease Monsieur the Cardinal. Jupiter breathed once more. The Seigneur de Bourgeois, he cried at the top of his lungs to the crowd, which continued to hoot him. We are going to begin at once. Emily, Jupiter, for the day Pibes. All hail Jupiter. Applaud, citizens, shouted the scholars. Noel, Noel, good, good, shouted the people. The hand clapping was deafening, and Jupiter had already been drawn under his tapestry, while the hall still trembled with acclamations. In the meanwhile, the personage who had so magically turned the tempest into dead calm, as our old Indian Cormier had modestly retreated to the half shadow of his pillar, and would, no doubt, have remained invisible there, motionless as mute as before, had he not been plucked by the city by two young women, who, standing in the front row of the spectators, had noticed his colloquy with Michel Chiffon and Jupiter. Master, said one of them, making him a sign to approach. Hold your tongue, my dear Leonard, said the neighbor, pretty, fresh, and very brave, in consequence of his dressed up in the best attire. He is not a crowd. He's a big lady. You must not say fast to him, but this here. This here, said Leonard. The stranger approached the lady. What would you have of me, that tells? Oh, nothing, replied Leonard, in great confusion. It is my neighbor, your step, La Jocelyne, who wishes to speak with you. Not so, replied your step, blushing. It was Leonard who called you master. I only told him to say this here. A few young girls dropped their eyes. The man, who asked nothing better than to end with a conversation, looked at them with a smile. So, I have nothing to say to me, Gonzales? Oh, nothing at all, replied Gisquet. Nothing, said Leonard. The tall, light-haired young man moved into the set, but the two curious names had no mind to let slip their cries. This here, said Gisquet, with the impetuosity of an open sluice, or of a woman who is made of her mind. Do you know that soldier who is to play the part of Madame the Virgin in the mystery? You mean the part of Jupiter, replied the stranger. Oh, yes, said Leonard. Isn't he stupid? So, do you know Jupiter? Monsieur Gibbon, replied Leonard. Yes, madame. He has a fine beard, said Leonard. Do you know what they are about to say to you? Fine? inquired the sketch timidly. Very fine, mademoiselle, replied the unknown, without the slightest hesitation. What is it to be? said Leonard. The good judgment of Madame de Virgin, or morality, if you please, Gonzalez. Ah, that makes the difference, responded Leonard. A brief silence of speed, broken by the stranger. It is a perfectly new morality, and one which has never been in Asia. Then, it is not the same one, said Gisquet, that was given two years ago, on the day of the entrance of Monsieur de Leggett, and where three handsome maids played the parts. And silence, said Leonard. And all naked, added the young man. Leonard lowered her eyes modestly. Gisquet glanced up and didn't see. Continued with a smile. 
was a very pleasant thing to see. Today, it is a morality made expressly for Madame de Bonnoiselle of Flanders. Do they sing shepherd songs? inquired the step. Fine, said the stranger. In a morality, they must not confound styles. If it were a farce, well and good. That is a pity, resumed Gisquette. That day, at the Ponceau Fountain, there were wild men and women who bought and assumed many aspects as they sang bitter motets and bergerettes. That which is suitable for a legate, returned the stranger with a good deal of dryness, is not suitable for a princess. And beside them, resumed Leonard, played many brass instruments, making great melodies. And for the refreshment of the passers by, continued his friend, the falcon started through three mouths, one meal for Hippocrats, of which everyone drank the wish. And a little below the pot so of the Trinity, pursued by a man, there was a crash of the fall, but without any speaking. How well I remember that, exclaimed his friend. God on the cross, and the two thieves on the right and left. Here the young gossips, growing warm at the memory of the entrance of Monsieur de Legate, both began to talk at once. And further on, at the painter's room, there were other personages, very richly clad. And at the fountain of St. Innocent, that huntsman who was chasing the hind with a great family of dogs and hunting horns. And at the Paris slaughterhouses, stages representing the fortress of the oven. And when the legate passed, you remember just that, they made the assault, and the English all had their throats cut. And against the gate of the Chateau, there were very fine personages. And at the Porto Sound, it was all built above. And when the legate passed, they let fly in the cage more than two hundred sorts of birds. It was the beautiful Leonard. It will be better today. Father, you promise us that this mystery will be fine, said Jusquet. Without doubt, he replied, but he added, with a certain emphasis, I am the author of it, damsels. So the young girls, quite taken aback, replied the poet, brightening a little. That is to say, there are two of us. Behind my shop, who has sought the place and erected a framework of the theater of the woodland. And I, who have made the piece, my name is Pierre Gringoire. The author of this suit could not have served Pierre Cornier with more pride. Our readers have to be able to observe that a certain amount of time must have already elapsed from the moment when Jupiter had retired beneath the tapestry to the instant when the author of the new morality had thus abruptly revealed himself to the innocent admiration of Gisquette and Leonard. Remarkable fact, that whole crowd, so tumultuous but a few moments before, now waited immediately on the word of the previous, which proves the eternal truth, still experienced every day in our theaters, that the best means of making the public wait patiently is to assure them that one is about to begin instantly. However, Scott of Zoran had not fallen asleep. Hola, hey! he shouted suddenly in the midst of the peaceable wind which had followed the tumult. Jupiter, Madame the Virgin, the fools of the devil, aren't you cheering on us? The peace, the peace, commence, or we will commence again! That was all that was needed. The music of high and low instruments immediately became audible from the interior of the stage. The tapestry was raised. Four personages, motley attire and painted faces, emerged from it, climbed the steep ladder of the theater, and arrived upon the upper platform, arranged themselves in a line before the public, whom they saluted with profound reverences. Then the symphony ceased. The mystery was about to begin. The four personages, after having used their rich reward of applause for their reverences, began, in the midst of profound silence, a polar, which we gladly spare the reader. Moreover, as happens in our own day, the 
who, without caring that he was interrupting the spectacle and disturbing the universal composure, shouted boldly, Look! See that sickly creature asking alms! Anyone who has thrown a stone into a frog pond, or fired a shot into a covey of birds, can form an idea of the effect produced by these incongruous words in the midst of a general attention. It made Gringoire shudder as though it had been an electric shock. The prologue stopped short, and all heads turned tumultuously towards the beggar, who, far from being disconcerted by this, saw in this incident a good opportunity for reaping his harvest, who had begun to whine in a doleful way, half closing his eyes the while. Charity, please! Well, upon my soul, resumed Joan, it's Clopin Trifaux. Fall away, my friend! Did your sword bother you on the leg, and you have transferred it to your arm? So saying, with the dexterity of a monkey, he flung a bit of silver into the grey felt hat which the beggar held in his ailing arm. The mendicant received both the arms and the sarcasm without wincing, and continued in the memorable tones. Charity, please! This episode considerably distracted the attention of the audience, and a goodly number of the spectators, among them, both Dan, whose hand, and all the perks of their head, really applauded this eccentric duet, which the scholar, with his shrill voice, and the mendicant had just improvised in the middle of the prologue. Gringoire was highly displeased, and recovering from his first stupefaction, he despaired himself to shout to the four personages on the stage, Go on! What the devil! Go on! Without even deigning to cast a glance of disdain upon the two interrupted At that moment, he felt someone pluck at the hem of his suit. He turned round, and not without ill humor, and found considerable difficulty in smiling. But he was obliged to do so nevertheless. It was the pretty arm of Gisquet La Gancienne, which, as it is really, was soliciting his attention in this manner. Monsieur, said the young girl, are they going to continue? Of course, replied Gringoire, a good deal shocked by the question. In that case, monsieur, she resumed, would you have the courtesy to explain to me what they are about to say? interrupted Gringoire. Well, listen. No, said Gisquette, but what they have said so far. Gringoire started like a man whose wound has been probed to the quick. A plague on the stupid and the gold-headed little girl, he muttered the truth. From that moment forth, Gisquette was nothing to him. In the meantime, the actors had obeyed his injunction, and the public, seeing that they were beginning to speak again, began once more to listen, not without having lost many beauties in the sort of sovereign joint which was formed between the two portions of the piece thus abruptly cut short. Grigois commented on it bitterly to himself. Nevertheless, tranquility was gradually restored. The scholar held his peace. The mendicant counted over some coins in his hat, and the piece resumed the upper hand. It was, in fact, a very fine work, and one which, as it seems to us, might be put to use today by the aid of a little rearrangement. The exposition, rather long and rather empty, that is to say, according to the rules, was simple, and Grugois, in the candid sanctuary of his own conscience, admired its clearness. As the reader may surmise, the four allegorical passages were somewhat weary with having traversed the three sections of the world without having found suitable opportunity for getting rid of their golden dolphin. Thereupon, a year